We're grateful for your presence here. And I'm grateful for the music team and the and the tech team and all the preparation that they have brought forward just for these few moments. I ask that you would bless them and God just help them to know how much we appreciate what they do week after week. And God, I do pray for the uh, Kid Zone kids and their teachers, their leaders, that uh, the lesson this morning would be encouraging to them and even challenging them to live their faith at school, in their families, in life. And now, God, I ask that you would hide me within your shadow. These people don't need to see me and they don't need to hear my words. But God, we need to know and to see you in this broken world. We need to know that your voice is still strong in us and through us and to us. And so I pray that I would recede and that you would now come forward to teach all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We're in this uh, message series called The Easter Experience. And we began last week, I was looking at John 13, 1 to 17. The next slide, John 13, 1 to 17 was all about your life has a purpose. And if you remember that story, that was the story of Jesus meeting with the disciples. And it was at a time when he took off his outer garment and he went to each one of his disciples and he washed their feet as a way of expressing serving them. He got to Peter. Peter is a very impulsive man. And Peter said, Lord, you shouldn't wash my feet. Jesus, you, you are over all of us. You should not wash your feet. To which Peter responded, if I don't wash your feet, if you don't let me serve you, then you will have no part of me. So Peter responded, well, okay, then wash my feet all the way up to my head. Peter was learning a central lesson. Take a look at this next slide. I shared with you last week that you cannot have Jesus halfway. He doesn't give Peter or you or me that option. You cannot have a half of Jesus. You can't get a small size Jesus. Either he is going to be a part of your life or you are really going to seek and understand who he is and, and what he can be in your life, or you're just really just playing church. And we just need to understand that. So this week, we're going to take a, a different passage from John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is all about change. Go to the next slide. Um, John chapter 20, verses 1 to 19 your life can change. And I'm going to begin uh, just reading the first three verses. John 20, 1 to 19. I'm going to begin with the first three verses. Let me just read this to you. Afterwards, this is after the resurrection, after the crucifixion resurrection. This is the last chapter in the book of John. John is the fourth uh, book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and John, essentially, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, they are biographies of Jesus. They tell his story, uh, his birth, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection. Now, this story is the last chapter in John, and it tells a story um, after the resurrection. After Jesus, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going out to fish. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. There are a lot of different ways to study the Bible. Sometimes I will tell people if they are a new Christian or if they're really just seeking what does Jesus mean and what's he all about, I will tell them to get one of the Bibles in which the words of Jesus are in red. And I'll say, go read the red. That's all you have to do. 
well, shouldn't I know some of the other stuff that's going on? I said, yeah, eventually you should, but if you just want to know what Jesus said, you know, just kind of what he was all about, go read the river. <laughs> Sometimes they won't want to know, um, and we'll want to learn about the church. What's the church really supposed to be? What's the church supposed to do? What's its central focus? Now, I'll say, if you really want to know what the church is supposed to be all about, then read the book of Acts. Just, just go read the book of Acts. It's when the church, the, the Christian church, was really born after the crucifixion resurrection of Jesus. And you will see what the church is supposed to be, how it's supposed to act. And you'll also see how it screwed up even 2,000 years ago. Because it was not perfect even at that time. So there's a lot of different ways to read, study the Bible. One of the ways that I will sometimes uh, do kind of a devotional reading of the Bible is I will just pray ahead of time and say, God, you know, just, just highlight something in here to me for my life. One of the things I did when I was preparing for this message was that. I said, God, just highlight some words to me. And the words that were highlighted to me, this could be just me, in the first three verses were these words. Click. <laughs> I'm going out to fish. I know. Kind of crazy, don't you think? No. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going out to fish. Well, what, why would, why would, why would that be highlighted? They have just lived all this life with Jesus. And they have been let down. The crucifixion, resurrection, what's going on? I don't know about this new life. I don't know about all this stuff. You know what? I'm going back to my old life. That's what that represents. Simon Peter was a fisherman. That's what he knew. That's what he did. That's what's his life before all of this crazy new life stuff that Jesus talked about. And he just said, you know, I'm, I'm going back to my old life. I'm, I'm kind of done with this church thing. After all, I've just lived with people for three years and they let me down. Jesus promised that there was going to be a whole new order in the world. That ain't happening. And after all, Peter's thinking to himself, I even denied knowing Jesus. So clearly I haven't changed either. You know what? I'm going back to fish. Essentially saying, I'm going back to the life I knew. I'm going to get out of this. Have you ever been burned? You ever been disappointed by something? You ever been let down by people? What do you want to do? Forget it. I, I, don't, I don't need this. Simon Peter was just at the place where this whole new thing was going on and it was going to be this great new life and it was a new start and everybody was going to come together and it was going to be so exciting and then Jesus dies. And even he, Simon Peter, who at one time had said to Jesus, you are the Christ, you're the Son of God, everything in life is going to change. And then right after that he says, Jesus, Jesus who? I don't even know him. You ever done that? You have. Perhaps you've come here on a Sunday morning and gotten really moved and determined you know, my life is going to be different. I'm going to break that old habit. I'm going to mend these relationships. Things are just going to get better. And then about Tuesday or Wednesday, or Sunday afternoon, and eventually you just get tired and you say, you know, I, I'm, I'm just done. How about you? How about you? When you get burned, when you get frustrated, when you get angry, when somebody else lets you down, what do you do? Do you lash out? Some of you do. Or do you retreat in? Some of us do that. Simon Peter, I think, was just simply saying, 
I'm going back to my life. You people continue on in this. That's fine. It ain't working for me anymore. I'm done. You ever had that feeling before? Fourth verse. Early in the morning, they had been fishing all night, remember? Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you caught any fish? No, they answered. Jesus responds, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. They threw their net on the right side of the boat, and they were unable to bring the net in because of the large number of fish that they caught. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around his waist, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed into the boat, towing the net full of fish. After all, you don't want to leave your fish behind. For they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coal. There was fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net, and it was full of fish, 153. There were so many fish in there, but the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to say to him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord Jesus came, took the bread, gave them some, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead. I love the setting of that story because Jesus is on the shore and they're out there about 100 yards and they're fishing. And Jesus says, did you catch any fish? No, throw it on the other side. It's a good little detail because sometimes from the shore you can see into the water a little more clearly than people that are out there. He's just saying, look on the other side. Maybe there's some fish over there. Sometimes we think that this is a big miracle, and maybe it was, but maybe Jesus so saw some fish. And I love the detail that it was early in the morning, and they didn't recognize who Jesus was. Why do you think they didn't recognize who Jesus was? Well, maybe it was dark. But you know what? I think it was. I think it was because they stopped looking for him. There are times in life when we stop looking for Jesus in our life and you know what? We don't see Him. There are times we're involved at work. There are times when we're involved in family. There are things going on in our life and the last thing we look for is Jesus until we get in deep trouble, of course. But I think sometimes we don't see Jesus in our lives because we're not looking for Him. Maybe it was dark, maybe they didn't see him, but it clearly seems to me that one of the things we can learn from this story is we might not see Jesus interact with us because we're not looking for him. And so the question is, throughout your day when things get dark, throughout your day when you're trying to accomplish something, Throughout your day, when you're just going through average life, are you looking for Jesus to be interacting with you throughout your day, or are you not? And truth be told, when we are at school, or when we are at work, when we're driving through in our cars, when we are interacting with other people, the last person we want to see sometimes is Jesus because of what we're doing or saying at that particular time. Sometimes we just want to fire off that email and put that person in their place and we don't want Jesus sitting next to us. Sometimes we just want to say something to somebody and the last person we want to look around and see is Jesus staring at us in the face. Sometimes we just want to go back to fishing. Can't I just go back to fishing and forget all this church stuff? And Peter, of course, the impulsive one, if you know the story of Jesus interacting with Peter, Peter was always the one who said, ready, fire, aim. 
Think about it, people. But when Peter fully and finally aligns himself with Jesus, Jesus takes his rashness and his impulsiveness. Here's the deal. Jesus takes Peter's worst quality and turns it into his strength. This next quote, I think, is what I'm trying to say. When Peter fully and finally aligns himself with Jesus, his arrogant rashness becomes his passion, and his passion ignites the fire, and that fire is what begins to change the world. So the question is, when you are interacting with Jesus, what negative quality of yours is he trying to take from you and perhaps turn into a positive quality because all of us are either arrogant and rash or all of us are sometimes a little too worried about the future or all of us have something that we would consider the dark side and Jesus is trying to say let me shine some light on that dark side because it can be turned and used into a force for good because it is out of the Bible says our weakness that God's strength is most strong what is your weakness where are you broken where are you wounded Peter was wounded and broken because he was arrogant and rash and brash and just jumped in and Jesus saw that and wow in the hands of Jesus lives are changed and arrogant brashness can become passion do not miss this point friends do not miss this point that Peter is trying to live out his life and he sometimes gets frustrated and sometimes people around him frustrate him. Does that happen to you? And we want to lash out or we want to withdraw away. And Jesus is saying, neither one of those is the appropriate option. But the appropriate option is for me to take who you are in your brokenness and use that brokenness to make a difference in somebody else's life because everybody has a broken spot. or two or three. And if you hide your brokenness, and if, and if you hide your brokenness in, in you, and if you hide your brokenness, and if I hide my brokenness, then what do we have? I'll tell you what we ain't got. is a church. But if you bring in your brokenness and we look at the possibility of Jesus taking your brokenness and my brokenness, we can be stronger together. So, when you face that moment, when Jesus is trying to get into your broken places, what do you? Do you give up or do you give in? What's your response? Give up. Just go back fishing. I am done with this. I'm done with this church. I'm done with this life. I'm done with this Jesus stuff. Just let me sit here on Sunday morning. Stop messing with my life. Give up. Or give in to the possibility that you could have strength in Jesus Christ that you, you cannot imagine. How would you like to have strength for life that you cannot imagine? There's that great little detail of the story, and it's about to take a nasty turn here for Peter. The great little detail of the story, did you catch it? That when they come in, Jesus is sitting there and he's cooking some fish over this coal fire. That's the word, it's coal fire. Some of you know, perhaps some of you don't know, is the only other time in the entire New Testament where the words coal fire are used or when Jesus 
or when Peter is sitting around a coal fire and he denies knowing Jesus. And so you think that Peter came in on shore and he saw that coal fire? You don't think he was reminded, oh man, I wonder if Jesus knows that I denied knowing him. So where do you need to fully align with Jesus in your life more? Go ahead, raise your hand and tell me. I know. Are there some anger? Are there some ego stuff going on? Are there some relational issues? Or has faith simply become a Sunday morning sidebar for you? Sing some nice songs. Why, the band did a good job today. Listen to some preaching. Boy, Rick knocked it out of the park once again. <laughs> Work with me, people. <laughs> nice church, nice refreshments, nice building. <laughs> are you trying to figure out ways that you can engage faith no matter what age you are, no matter how many years you have sat in a church building? Are you trying to figure out what are the broken places in my life that I still need to let Jesus in so he can use? The point is not for him to heal your broken places. That would be awesome. But I got to tell you, more often than not, for 34 years of doing pastoral ministry, more often than not, Jesus is willing to use your broken places to show other people, even people with broken places, can be strong in me. So ask for healing in your broken places is great. Letting Jesus into those broken places and using those broken places to encourage others is awesome. Where do you and I need to let him more fully in? Could it be that Jesus is wanting to harness those broken places in you? We always talk, here this is the deal, listen to this. We always talk about things that need to change. You know the school system, they, it, it just needs to change. You know the city government, it, the man, they just need to change. And the national government, oh my goodness, don't get me started on the president and the Congress because it needs to change. And I may agree with you on all of those things, or I may not, but the point is this next quote on the slide from Billy Graham, I think, captures it. The world does need changing. Society does need changing. The nation does need changing, but we will never change it until we ourselves are changed. Because we are society. We are the ones that need to be changed. And notice, it's very important, I think. I like the quote, but I think what's really important here is he doesn't say until we change ourselves. He's indicating we do need to be changed. But there are some things about us we can't self-change. Sometimes we need to be changed from the outside. And sometimes we need to let him in to change from the inside. But maybe that's just me. Maybe it's not you. Verse 15. Let me wrap up this story. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter answered him again, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was wounded because Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Parenthetically, Peter, if Jesus knows all things, 
He knows you denied Him three times. And Peter, He just asked you three times, do you love me? Don't miss the most obvious part of this story. Is Peter's potential of redeeming each broken place where he said, I don't know who Jesus is. I've never heard of him. I don't know who that guy is. Don't miss that Jesus gives Peter and us the opportunity to heal the broken places, to bind up the wounds, or to use a broken place for new life. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will be your hands will be stretched out. And someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Don't you imagine, I'm going to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes, but don't you imagine this was kind of like a quiet breakfast? They're just fishing, just coming in. Simon Peter runs and he sees the coal fire. Boy, the last time I was a coal fire, I denied knowing Jesus. I am in deep trouble now. It's over there. Jesus says, let's have breakfast. I mean, I would be awfully quiet at this breakfast. I'd be cutting my fish. Please don't know I denied you. Please don't know I denied you. Please don't know I denied you. And Jesus never pointed his finger at him and said, um, take it back. He never pointed his finger at him and said, you sinned. You're done. He never pointed his finger at Simon Peter and said, you know, I, uh, Peter, I've been with you three years, put up with you enough, done. What he did say was, Peter, do you love me? So at this quiet breakfast, Jesus is eating and they're talking and Jesus looks over at Simon Peter and with everybody else seated around, he looks directly in Simon Peter's eyes. Don't tell me that wouldn't be uncomfortable. And you know how you know it would be uncomfortable? Because there are some times in your life when you're doing something, or thinking about doing something, or falling into the habit again, or wishing you hadn't spoken some kind of words, when all of a sudden you snap to attention and you realize that God is dwelling in the midst of you. And you wish you could take it all back. And you can't. But Jesus responds, looking you in the eyes the same way he did to Simon Peter. He said, just tell me, do you love me? Yes. Then go do my work. Don't dwell on what you've done wrong, but let me dwell with you so you can do it right. Capture that thought, friends. Don't dwell on what you've done wrong, but let me dwell with you so you can do it right. Don't dwell on what is broken, but let me dwell with you so that we can offer healing to others. And what may be the most key phrase in the entire story is up on this next slide. Follow me. Follow me were some of the very first words that Jesus spoke to Simon Peter. And now they are some of the very last words he will speak to Simon Peter. And guess what? They are some of the first words that he spoke to you. And someday... When you are released into his kingdom, for followers of Christ, they will be some of the last words he speaks to you and says, it's time for you to follow me.
So what I like to say about this particular ending to this story is Jesus' story doesn't change. It doesn't change. He said, follow me in the beginning when you first became a Christian, if you were a Christian. And at the end, he's going to say, follow me into the kingdom. It's the same story that it is with Peter, that it is with us. No matter how many times we denied, how much brokenness we got, no matter what we have done in life, his story remains the same. Do you love me? Do my work follow me? Jesus was brilliant. But he's not complicated. We make the gospel, which simply means good news, we make it complicated. When all he is saying is, do you love me in the best way you can? Will you try to turn your life so that it adheres to the life that I'm calling you to? Will you go in this direction with me? Will you let me dwell in the midst of you? Awesome, now follow me. Well, yeah, but what else do you want me to do? I'm really not asking you to do anything else. Follow me. And the last words and first words to Peter are also, last slide, the first and final words to us. I'm going to show you a video. This is a video that is an illustration of the change that can occur in your life. Your life. No matter where the brokenness is, no matter how much brokenness there is, this is an illustration that the Lord can make beautiful things out of dust. The Lord can make wonderful things out of us. Could a garden come up from this ground? 